Welcome to Mindful. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Paula Contreras, I'm delighted to have a chance to speak with you today. You have been very uh, dedicated uh, with great compassion and caring and also with great scholarship and expertise to the area of human trafficking. And that's what I look forward to talking with you about today. You are a recipient of an early career award from the American Psychological Association uh, uh, for uh, women in psychology. That you served on an important task force, the APA task force, uh, which issued a report on human trafficking of women and girls. And that is available and is, uh, can be found mm -hmm. online. Uh, and that was uh, uh, published in 2014. Mm -hmm and that you're currently serving as the vice chair of the Committee for Women in Psychology and your group has recently issued a new position statement on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Let's begin by uh, creating some parameters here. Okay. People often think about human trafficking uh, simply about the sex trade and I know that that's a very important component. Mm -hmm. I know that that's not the exclusive purview of people that work in human trafficking. Yeah. So could you set some parameters for us? Sure. You're absolutely right. Most of the focus has been on sex trafficking. Um, but there's also uh, trafficking for manual labor that goes underreported. Sex trafficking also goes underreported. But um, trafficking for manual labor um, for a variety of reasons is is just more difficult to identify for the media, um, it's not a topic that can be sensationalized in the same way that um, sex trafficking can be sensationalized. Trafficking where people end up working, say for instance in, in a factory or in agriculture um, or in somebody's home as, as domestic help. In trafficking for manual labor, um, there seems to be many more international victims that are that are affected by trafficking for manual labor. So these are populations that are going to oftentimes hide within the population of people that we refer to as undocumented here in the United States. It's a very uh, strong reason why why these people are very hard to identify. Yes. So you have not only been a very well-respected and beloved teacher of graduate students, but you've taken an on as part of your mission to be a public educator. Yes. And in your work in, as a public educator, what do you want the individual who's less informed or perhaps not in a mental health or healthcare field to understand about the prevalence of trafficking, about the issues? Um, what are some of the key points about uh, the, uh, the breadth and depth of the problem. With human trafficking, establishing prevalence has been very complex for some of the reasons that I already talked about, that this is a hidden population. So we don't have prevalence numbers that we can point to right now with enough certainty and to say these are the numbers that we can count on, you know, much like we have nowadays um, with respect to the prevalence of sexual abuse, for instance. We don't have that for human trafficking yet. However, we know enough about it where we can say with absolute certainty that it is an issue that alongside trying to establish prevalence, we also need to attend to at the psychosocial level. So the more um, we've had providers and different groups of people coming together to um, engage in actions that will identify more people that are falling victim to this, the more we're understanding that we don't need the numbers to do the work, that we actually have to do the work. So I think that's, that's, that's an important point to make. I'm not one of the people that would say we really don't have to pay attention to the numbers. I think we, we need people that can come to this and um, help us develop methodologies that'll get us to a place where we can understand um, important prevalence trends because as, as you know that's just going to make us much more effective in, in how we address the, the issue. So that's one thing. 
um, that um, when I speak especially to people in academic circles, that is something that um, I highlight and I stress because I know that that community is going to be very interested in, in that question in particular. Now, for the public, I always stress that we need to work on all the stigmatizing messages that are attached to people who have fallen prey to this kind of situation. Um, and we need to deeply examine those and make a concerted effort to shift our awareness to a place where we can be more compassionate towards people that get caught up in, the, in these types of situations. So I'm referring, for instance, specifically to the kind of attitude that some factions and sections of, of our society have developed towards people who are living with an undocumented status. Um, that kind of environment only pushes people further into hiding that are suffering from a situation of, of trafficking. In the case of sex trafficking, all the stigmatizing language and all the stigmatizing attitudes that we've had for decades in this country towards people who are caught up in the sex trade. The other term that we use to refer to that population of people are people who are in prostitution. So when we present the issue of human trafficking, it's, it's easy to talk about those cases where you would, you know that your public is going to immediately say this is terrible, we have to do something to stop it. As an educator and um, as a researcher in this area, I also strongly believe that it's important to present and talk about those cases where there are complexities that are gonna make people struggle around their position in relation to, to a person's predicament. Um, because the routes into trafficking are, are pretty complex. This population ends up carrying, for some people or many people, a double stigma. Yes. And so it's hard to get the kind of funding and attention and community activism when people are carrying these prejudices. Absolutely. Oh, the fundraising for this is very, very difficult. Very difficult, yeah. What's a system, a systemic or, uh, or a public health type of intervention that is happening in this field? And then what's an example of a more traditional mental health intervention, which might be in a group or in a dyadic interaction? And then I'd like to move to hearing, you're a very active researcher and hearing more about your research. Okay. But sure. I wonder if we might start with this question. First thing I'll say is that one um, issue that's raised all over the literature on, on human trafficking, especially literature that, that's describing the provision of services to people with histories of trafficking, are how incredibly mistrusting the population is towards service providers. What we did in the United States is that we started to um, direct people who were identified as victims of trafficking, especially victims of sex trafficking, to the domestic violence shelters. And so the women who were self-identifying as um, being survivors of domestic violence, victims of domestic violence, they did not want to be mixed with women who had been involved in the sex trade. Um, and so those, that, that, was, that was one of the prominent issues. And also providers um, having had very substantial training to work with survivors of, of domestic violence had had very little to no training to interact uh, with, with victims and survivors of human trafficking. Over time, what I've seen happening, and I think this is, this is an important response that the public health sector needs to pay very close attention to, is the question of the positive impact that bringing on peer support advocates can have. So these are people who have um, been formally exploited themselves and they were able to either escape or rescued, pull out from these situations and they've um, healed themselves, um, sought out treatments and uh, connected with communities that have helped them to heal and then they've made it a mission thereafter to help others come out. So what you see right now is this robust 
peer movement that's developing. And some of the groups that I'm working with right now, they are very, very focused on how do we do this? So how do we get professionals like myself um, and peers who have a wealth of experience and knowledge too, how do we get those two groups working together? I see the peers that I work with being able to develop almost instantaneous trust with someone where it would take me months, maybe years, or maybe um, at times, and this happens too, there are people who just won't ever trust me because I can't possibly relate to their experience. This is the area that we need to be paying a lot of attention to, but it's, it's complicated because it's a messy area. Indeed. Right, it, it's, it's messy, <laughs> so, so people are hesitant about it. I'd like to ask you to provide one example of, of your current research. Yes. And I know that you're also developing a, a website and would love to hear a little bit about that as we're moving towards our conclusion. I've had the good fortune of uh, being very highly supported in my anti-trafficking work here at the college. And recently, we launched about two weeks ago a web portal, a part of our website uh, that's called the Human Trafficking Community Research Hub. One of the main missions of the hub is to compile studies, information that would be relevant to mental health practitioners and providers. Uh, there's also a subsection in there where I'm compiling information that has to do with this question about peer work. I've had the opportunity to do that at the college in collaboration with some of our community partners. That's a very important part of the hub. The studies that we're housing in that, in that section right now was a study that we did uh, last year on trends in the online commercial sex trade in Massachusetts. And we have that uh, the results of that study up. We had a meeting here at the college where we were very fortunate to host a number of representatives of law enforcement. Um, uh, Peter DiMazio, the head of Homeland Security, was here interested in, in seeing our findings and uh, we were hoping, we distributed these findings, hoping that law enforcement would be able to use them to identify trafficking hotspots in across the state or you know at least it's an initial effort towards that currently the study that we're working on right now is a study that's going to aim to understand more about close relationships and its overlap with either being able to escape from trafficking being able to exit trafficking or having a hard time and struggling. People become very attached to their traffickers or can become very attached to their traffickers. And when they do become very attached to their traffickers, uh, leaving their traffickers feels nearly impossible. We have loosely referred to this in the literature as traumatic attachment. Some people have talked about Stockholm Syndrome in relation to this, but we lack research to understand more from the experience of this population, what is it really? Because of course we also have to recognize that we're talking about a crime here. So we're talking about a person who, the trafficker, um, who is actively doing something to lure someone in, keep them locked into this, um, this very unhealthy cycle, and uses that to financially exploit the other person. And then we also have um, issues of demand that are important to understand as well, and you know they play a big role. So um, people are willing to pay money for sex. People are willing to pay money for cheap labor. Rather than going for these very large expensive studies, that there is value in focusing on micro studies and that a conglomerate of micro studies over time can actually give us a lot of information that will hopefully be helpful to um, move towards eradicating this, this terrible crime. 
So in your very thorough answer, you highlighted what you feel are some of the important next steps and this hub to create a community yes. that can work together, the idea of micro communities, the idea of what are the psychological variables that keep someone attached in an abusive and exploitative relationship yes. are all current and next steps in your work. And uh, I wish we had more time, and I'm yeah. so delighted to have this opportunity, Dr. Contreras. Thank you. Thank you. For more information about the faculty members interviewed today and the topic of discussion, please follow these links.